This season, turn it up to 10. Sort of like a bad habit, we gon' do it again. Ready or not, we're gonna tie up some men. Go tell a 36, try to grab all the friends. We're back like we never left. On track like a treble clef. Skip a beat on the seventh rest. Bring feast, we don't pass them over. We got the first fruits, no way to show us. This yoke is easy, this burns light. Even with a loud mouth, trying to eat at the mic. Even if we down south, the humidity spike. Bales torn in two, so we gon' be all right. It's all grace till the half goes off. Heretics better run till the top blows off. Got them all stood still like a jaw full of Botox. Time to break them down like a jaw on a blow pop. Don't stop, they're in need of it though. Through grace, by faith, they could easily grow. New wave, new age, new way to see bro. Now, one truth, life, one way to the throne. It is Wednesday, uh, May 31st, 2023. This is Messiah Matters number 430. I'm all out of bubble gum. My name is Caleb Haig. <laughs> I don't chew bubble gum, but I remember Big League Chew as a kid. I thought it was cool. I'm Rob Vanna. My son still chews Big League Chew. It was like, and- you know... Big wad of shredded bubble gum. That's right. I said in the chat room before we started, I came to ch- challenge theology and chew bubble gum, and I'm all out of bubble gum. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a movie. Uh, he came. Yeah, exactly. And he's, yeah. and he's all out of bubble gum. I actually thought of that because of when I was a kid, there they were just, like first person shooters were just coming out, right? Like Wolfenstein was the first, and then Doom, and then Doom Two. And then Duke Nukem 3D. Now, I was not allowed to play any of these, by the way. But I had a friend, John Nichols. And John, and John, and John was allowed to play all of them. So I'd go to his house, and we'd play Duke Nukem 3D. I'm not even going to say, but there was a chew bubblegum line there. It was, it was part of my childhood as well. All right. What's up, everybody? How's it going? Welcome to everybody in the chat room. We are so happy that you are with us. It looks like a small gathering today in the chat room, but uh, they hey. still... They continue to trickle in, which is great. We're happy for the people that are there. And uh, we are grateful also for anybody who's watching this after the fact. We are thankful for our producers and our subscribers. And, uh, yeah, we're thankful for everyone. We're we're really thankful today. Uh, We're thankful for everybody who has given us topics for the day. And I think it's going to be an interesting day. I don't know. I thought last week was really good. I personally thought that last week was an excellent uh, show, but... I always like church history, so 
whatever. So if you want to be part of this conversation, if you want to help us steer the ship in terms of what we talk about, please, you can do this in multiple ways, but uh, seehagatorresource.com is our email address. Uh, we will see your email for sure. You can also leave comments on our YouTube videos. I see all of those as well. Some of them we choose, some of them we don't. You can also leave us a voicemail. Our hotline number is 253-465-3205. It's 253-465-3205. You won't talk to us. You talk to an answering machine. Tell us how much you love us. Hate us. Agree with us. Disagree with us. Whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Uh, you can say it all. We, we just the like the machine. attention. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> Uh, so I, I want to apologize to everyone for last week, last week. I, uh, now, I mean, I haven't even checked the site this morning, but, uh, last week our site was down, uh, the Messiah matter site. And so, uh, mm. but I got it back up and running. It took me, uh, it took me quite a while, actually. Uh, it took me like a day and a half to get it back up and running. Anyway, it should be up now. And, uh, yeah, you can go to messiahmatters.com, listen to any of our past shows. You can watch our past shows. You can uh, see show notes, you can uh, buy merch, you can read all about our, our show, and you can uh, read the, the lyrics to the intro song and listen to the intro song if it so pleases you. Okay. And let's not forget about Tor Resource. You can even walk around your local city streets yeah. rapping, rapping the lyric. It. Repping it. Rep the merch and rap the lyrics. There you go. Um, to rep, our and rap. Oh. rep and rap. So I now I haven't talked to uh, to Mike about this, our graphic artist. But Mike, uh, I'm going to talk to him this week about getting some Mystery Bible Theater 3000 merch for us as well because I think that's a great idea. Um, anyway, uh, torresource.com is who produces this show, and uh, what I'm starting to do is I'm going to about every other week or so I'm going to give you a product code that will be good for a week. Now I don't have one this week, but that means that uh, we're once again going to tell you that you should have a library membership. If you don't have a library membership at TorahResource.com, what is wrong with you? And yeah, I say that respectfully. I mean, Come on. Uh, the reason that you should have a library membership is because there is over 4,000 hours, 4,000 hours of audio up on the library membership. If you don't like audio, you want to read stuff, not a problem. All of our books are in uh, PDF format. You can reference our books, read the commentaries, do whatever you want. Uh, wealth of, of, uh, of information there. And if you like videos, guess what? Thousands of hours of video as well, believe it or not. And it's all for the low miles, price. Of, miles, miles of videos. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you could just go <laughs> for days and months, years. I mean, literally, it's... Light years. It's... It's amazing. Anyway, it's $100 for a year. I guarantee you, I will get, how's about this? Instead of a product code today, I will give you a guarantee. If you get, get a library membership for $100 and you don't think it's worth it, I will give you your money back. How's about that? I'll give you your money back. Go get a library membership, membership today. You should do it. It's easy to sign up. And as soon as you buy it, you can get into the library and start doing whatever, to start downloading, do whatever you want. It's amazing. Okay. Our producers have already been brought up on screen. Uh, last thing I'm going to tell you is subscribe. Okay. That's it. That's all I got for you. Now we're going to jump into topics. And we got a good, a good plethora of topics that we could talk about today. But today, we're going to start with this one. This is a great comment or a great, great question, I should say. This is from Brittany. Brittany says this. She says, so I have a question regarding the Lord's Supper and Passover. Pause. Let's pause right there and bring our audience back up to right speed. Right there, Caleb's ears yes. are, he's like tingling. Bing. Yes, exactly. Like, his radar is, okay. It's it's pinging. Pinging. Um, so let's just bring all of our audience up to speed in case you haven't been listening for, I don't know, it, it, maybe this is your first show, who knows. Forever. I have, I have suggested, and if you saw our show last week, I can't believe that I didn't get more emails on the whole sacraments thing, but whatever. Um, I have suggested that the Lord's Supper, which I would argue is probably the one staple of Christianity that runs through all denominations and runs through all heretical offshoots as well, right? I mean, you have communion in the yeah, Mormonism. Even Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses, um, uh, the Baptists, the Lutherans, the Catholics, you name it. Now... With that the said, Mormons. <laughs> the Mormons, yes, man, I gotta clip that. I, I, by the way, I got, I, I redid our soundboard. I, I pared everything down. So anyway, um, 
I have hypothesized, I have argued that uh, the, the communion that we, uh, that we celebrate today, when it says, do this in remembrance of me, is not talking about an institution that the church has made, but rather that it's talking about the Passover. Now, this, this is extremely controversial, especially with the, the teaching of the church that the communion confers grace. I don't know what that means. And I think that every denomination has a different understanding of what that means, that the, that the communion or the Eucharist uh, gives grace to the person who participates in it. But I have significant issue with language like that. And I think that that, is, that comes straight from the doctrine of transubstantiation. And if you don't know what that large word means, it's a good Scrabble word, but basically it just means that the, blood, the, uh, the wine and the bread become the physical body of Christ and the blood of Christ. And so when you are participating in the Eucharist, you, I, I put the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. Anyway, when you, uh, when you are participating in the Eucharist, you're actually ingesting the sacrifice of Christ. And since he is deity, you are ingesting deity. And therefore your tank of grace, which is probably on E right now, gets raised to half full or full or whatever, and now you saved, according to the Catholics. And this is why you have last rites if a person hasn't had uh, communion and then they, uh, then they sin. Well, now their grace, their grace uh, tank goes down a little bit, so you got to bring that back up to full. Now, of course, as an evangelical, I don't believe that, and neither does Rob. However... Go to an you know what I really I think it's like I think it's like when you go to the coffee stand and you get a card and they punch it and you get your tenth one free. There you go. I think that's what getting into heaven is like that. Like getting into heaven is if but you have to go to the same latte stand and you have to remember to bring your punch card. But once you get to that that tenth punch, you're golden. Can I tell you a story? <laughs> Can I tell yes. you a quick story? This is this Let's is kind it. of on topic, kind of off topic. So last week That's, after I love it that way. <laughs> after, yeah, right? Last week after our show, I went to jujitsu and I went to roll at jujitsu, right? Okay. So there is a, a guy that uh that that I roll with often. He's hilarious. And he he actually does have a real soft spot in my heart. I really like this guy. Anyway, he uh he's he's a Roman Catholic. And so, and so I like I'm on the ground and he's like on top, like, you know, I'm struggling to get good grips or whatever. And I, he's like, he said something like, so what'd you do today? <laughs> right? Like we're trying to kill each other. And he's like, so what'd you do today? And I was like, oh, nothing. Just talked on my show about how the, uh, the sacraments are nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> he's a blue belt, so he could kill me in a matter of seconds. But he uh, he just said, oh, you'll see. You'll see someday. Don't worry. You'll see. <laughs> he kept saying that. You'll see. So, I mean, the thing, the thing is that, yes, we're ruffling feathers. And, yeah, it might sound like we're kind of making fun of things like Catholicism. However, I do believe that this, I do believe that this is probably the biggest downfall in, theolo in theology of the church and this wasn't like a, a outlier theology. The, this theology of the sacraments shaped how the church views the sacraments today. A perfect example of this is go to any, uh, you know, I shouldn't say any, many evangelical churches today will still use language like the communion, you know, gives, it confers grace to, to those who take it. So this... Whether or not the, the evangelical church wants to admit this or not, this is a holdover of Catholic theology and a holdover of transubstantiation. And I think that, that when we look at, at denominations such as the Presbyterians, I do have a soft spot in my heart for the Presbyterians because of, of uh, like Ligonier Ministries, R.C. Sproul, right? Some of these champions, champion uh, uh, theologians of the 20th century have been Presbyterians, and I and I owe a great debt of of my theology. You know, I stand on the shoulders of a lot of these Presbyterians, but the Presbyterians are those who will say things like the, you know, we we receive grace from the communion. 
I think this is a really, really bad, I think this is really bad theology. I think this is some of the worst theology within the Presbyterian, within the Presbyterian denomination. I have very, by the way, I have very good Presbyterian friends. So I'm not trying to put down Presbyterianism. Like I said, I stand on the shoulders of, of these theologians. So anyway, so let's go on with Brittany's. Would they, uh, on this, now I'm, I'm totally yeah. out of my wheelhouse here, but in, I know in the Lutheran tradition, they call this the means of grace. Right. Mm. The means of grace. Would they, is there such a, a theological, uh, I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say dispensationalism, but a, a theological framework that encompasses some account for quote, Old Testament commandments as being means of grace. Like in other words, would they say but that was just for a different time, but like circumcision, Sabbath, quote, anything that we might easily think of as ceremonial commandments, although obviously we're not using the term ceremonial, but I mean, in those religious frameworks, would they think, yeah, that was a means of grace, but now that means of grace is no longer valid. It's no longer, it has ceased to be a means of grace. And now the eternal means of grace are, have been established now, never to be revoked. Is that, in other words, is there something about the, the discourse of the law being done away with? Like it's yes. no longer applicable yeah. tied to idea that it was indeed a legitimate means of grace, the commandments. So the, I don't know. I'm, I'm just, yes. so, so the, the, this is where we get into, and I remember last week, I, I kind of ran down some of the history of the idea of, um, of, of what is known as sacraments. There has been different throughout history. There's been different ideas. By the way, you can't find the, the word, like the, the idea of sacraments within the Bible. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's another, it's like ceremonial laws. It's, it's right. A and, and construct. In the, right. And in the beginning, Augustine is the one who tries to define it. He gives, he gives this, this kind of abstract two, you know, there's two requirements for it to be a sacrament. By the time you get into the middle age or into the, yeah, into the middle ages, now people are saying, "Well, no, it's it's there's more. We have to refine this more." And there there's nothing there's nothing wrong with refining <clears throat> theology, but the Catholic Church dis decides that there's seven sacraments. And so by the time by the time you get into the 1600s, and there kind of has to be seven. Like you can't have six. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, know, you can't well, have. There has to be seven. <laughs> nobody nobody actually wants to talk too much about sacraments. Uh, like. I shouldn't say that. People love to talk about the sacraments, but when we get into like Baptist faith, the Baptist denomination, or the uh, Presbyterian denomination, now all of a sudden we have we have a debate. How many how many sacraments are there? Because everyone's going to agree on two in, within the uh, within the Christian denomination structure, right? What are the two? Baptism and marriage, probably. No, I was going to say baptism in the Eucharist, like baptism oh, you, and oh, communion. You, yeah. Okay. Okay. So probably then, the merit, probably three then, because yeah. So merit. marriage is get, probably going to be thrown in there, but some of them will say, "Well, no, because and and this this is to your because questions. someone could be single. They you know like well, a you, single you, person doesn't have less grace. You than have married. You have the idea kind of slipped in to the sacrament debate of old covenant versus new covenant. So circumcision was a, was a sign of the old covenant. And therefore it was one of the sacraments of the it old covenant. It had validity, covenant. it endured, it meant what it meant. Yes. But it's no longer. Sabbath is the same. That was a sacrament of the old covenant. And these and this is where everybody's going to start flipping that language from, you know, covenant first covenant covenant of Moses, you know, the Sinai covenant, whatever you want to say, to old covenant. And so now they're they're slipping in old covenant as well. Right, so old covenant versus new covenant. So, since in this theological structure, the old covenant is done away with, and by the way, this is cross denominational as well, according at least to my understanding. the 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 Catholics are going to say this just as much as the Baptists are going to say this. The difference is, is they're going to disagree on the on what the sacraments of the new covenant are. So, what what I would suggest is that if we're going to use signs of a covenant as sacraments, then there is perhaps two sacraments, sacraments. Once again, I, I, I reject this language, but 
uh, the, there would be perhaps two sacraments attached to the new covenant, which would be baptism and uh, the Lord's Supper. However, I'm seeing the Lord's Supper as the celebration of Passover with the focus on Christ instead of the Passover itself. And this is where Brittany's comment comes in. So I'm saying, no, what, what the Christian church has been doing Essentially, since the second, maybe third century, all the way up until today, it's shifted. Right? We don't actually have the church. We don't have the church commi- uh, like declaring that people had to take the Eucharist in 12, until the 1200s at the Fourth Lateran Council. Right? This is when they say you have to take it because up until then, a lot of the a lot of the laity weren't taking the communion because they they it, that was for the priests. The priests did that. Right. And this is when you start to have transubstantiation really come into its own. And also at that council is when you have the, the Pope really taking on a completely different, I mean, giving being given the mouthpiece of God power. Okay, hang on just a sec. You cannot be a Presbyterian and a pronomian, in my opinion. Sean Fisher. Um, okay, let's pause right there. Oh, man, that's okay. This is going to take us in a totally different way. I have to respond to that, though. Okay. Sean, I, I understand why, why you would say that. However, we have to remember that the person who coined the phrase pronomian was Presbyterian. So the person who coined the phrase pronomian was Bond, Bonson, right? And Greg Bonson was a Presbyterian. So, uh, and, and Bonson himself says that there are levels of, of pronomianism, all the way from those who are uh, uh, believe that God's law is good and should be studied, someone like, say, R.C. Sprawl or B- Bonson himself, all the way through to those, and Bonson notes this is in, in his introduction to the book, all the way to those who believe that the sacrifices are still applicable today. So, he, so Bonson, in his use of the term pronomian, which simply, for those who don't know, means pro-law, would say that, the, that there is a it's sliding scale. a positive scale. attitude toward... Right. Anything from positive mm-hmm. attitude towards to the the uh, the sacrifices should still be kept. So I understand why you would say that, but I would disagree. Mm. But Sean Fisher says yes, he wasn't a pronomian. I I think I think that the the term pronomian is uh, wider than just Torah observance. I think that what people are attempting to do is take the term pronomian and make it into the Hebrew roots theological, like. The, the Hebrew roots theology, essentially. Right. You know, in other words, I, I'm hesitant to judge all, like, say, Christmas, Easter, Sunday Christianity as antinomian. Right. I, I'm not going to make that equivalent because I think we're we're supposed to attend to nuance and detail and and uh, but the, I think the idea of that spectrum is a helpful way to organize that. I agree. Okay, we're so far off topic. Thank you, though, Sean, for your comments. I understand that I that a lot of people disagree with me on this. That's fine. Um, but I think that we do have to give credence to um, uh, the way that the term was originally used. And although that although the term can change over time, certainly, I am extremely hesitant to say that uh, that a person. So, for instance, my good friend Jeff is a Presbyterian and is you know, but and is. I think going to probably become um, um, leadership in his church, but uh, I and you know he celebrates things like Christmas and so on and so forth. Uh, but he would certainly say that he's pronomian. In fact, I think that Jeff is the one who pretty much brought the resurgence of the term pronomian as well. So, I mean, if a person is a Sabbath keeper and, and keeps the kosher laws and celebrates the festivals, but also attends a Presbyterian church and believes in infant baptism and celebrates Christmas, are they pronomian? See, as soon as we start to put uh, restrictions on a specific theology, a theological view, because that's what I think pronomianism is. Pronomian is a theological view. So that's why there can be sliding scales of it. It's not a denomination. So... Okay, let's go back. We are so far, so far from our original comment. Brittany says, so I have a question regarding the Lord's Supper and Passover. If Jesus was simply celebrating the Passover, which that's what I say, and the Lord's Supper is the Passover, then what gives the church the authority 
to take the Lord's Supper more than once a year at Passover? Does it void it? And how do we handle the issue in non-Messianic gatherings? Okay, this is a fantastic question. So, if G- let's go back. We're going to take this snippet at a time. What gives the church the authority to take the Lord's Supper more than once a year? I think that uh, I don't, so I personally don't think that the church is taking the Lord's Supper more than once a year. I think that they think they are, but the Lord's Supper is the Passover. So if you want to do something that says, hey, this reminds me of Passover, and we're going to fellowship together, and we're going to, you know, we're going to eat together and worship together, and hey, doesn't this remind us of what Christ did at Passover? I think that that's actually what's going on in, in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. Is that they're having these they're having these meals, and they're remembering, uh, you know, Christ's death, resurrection, ascension, which automatically brings about the idea of the of the uh, Last Supper, and so maybe they're you know they start to eat meals together in worship, which they were doing anyway, right? The the Jews were were uh, saw certainly the Jews before Christ came on on the scene believed that eating was a um, was a form of worship, which is why they weren't, they, why it was against the, against the rules to eat with Gentiles. So would you say that these are like, let's just presume that Paul writing to the Corinthians is saying, giving, giving like this blanket approval in a way of like, look, if you're going to have these meals and I, it, it all hinges on this word as off as often as, as often you as you do it. it right right yeah. and how do we interpret that does that mean we can do it daily weekly monthly you know every other month or whatever or annually is there is it just is it so let's just say yeah there was similar to and we've talked about this before similar to in numbers chapter nine where they celebrate the first memorial passover so it's they've been out of the land almost a full year it's coming on the anniversary of the actual exodus God says, keep the Passover. So they're in the wilderness of Sinai. They've got the Mishkan set up, et cetera. And then it says there were some people who were impure and God gives this uh, accommodation to celebrate Pesach in the second month for those who were somehow uh, incapable of participating. So the idea there, even in the Torah, in the book of Numbers, participation in the Pesach could by God's own word, be uh, fulfilled in the second month rather than the first month. Is it possible Paul sees this as a, a precedent to say, okay, there's two parallel lines here. One is obligation to remember redemption. The other is recognition that there are constraints on the human side that prevent the ideal. And so yeah, and, it's possible Paul sees yeah. that and says, you know what, if the Torah allows, if God allows for that, then what's wrong with a teaching meal, right? A meal that is a teaching meal where the gospel is taught to people who are from a pagan background. They they might not, you know what I mean? That's like they don't have in the any diaspora. Yeah. yeah, in the dia- yeah, a, lo- so, a heavily Gentile. Why not have a teaching meal that is teaching them about the feasts, about the calendar, but also so it, it it's based in the Torah, but it also leads all the way up to who Yeshua is, and what was the significance of that night and of that meal? Because you, there's no way around it. I mean, Paul, is it's central that that is a Passover, that Yeshua is the Pascha, he says in chapter 5, and by chapter 10 and 11, he's rehearsing the night he was betrayed, right? He's going through the core uh, situation of that Passover meal. So, uh, so yeah, I, I agree with you that I think that, you know, and it's possible there could be churches out there that when they do communion, you know, another, it's going to be another spectrum. You're going to have some that have leavened bread and juice, and some are probably going to have unleavened bread and wine. And I bet there are pastors out there. I mean, I, I don't know any personally, but they're probably say this is a mini rehearsal of the Passover. This is a, remember, we're remembering something that has to do with the the fulfillment of the Passover. 
So, so are they mini teaching meals, I guess? Right. So um, there's some interesting comments here. One of the places that people will uh, go, and I believe on a shame of Jesus, and I could be wrong on on the where he is tr- attempting to go with these comments, but um, I think the main argument are, are the verses that are brought up by unashamed of Jesus. So he says, do this in remembrance of me. Then he quotes 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you could proclaim the death, uh, the Lord's death till he comes. And then uh, he, he's going to, he quotes Acts two forty six. but I think that that is, we'll talk about all this. So um, th- I think that the main the main verse that people go to when talking about this is exactly that. First Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, a lot of people believe that this is a slam dunk for the communion. However, I believe that uh, people like Andrew McGowan and others have have strongly shown, given ample evidence, that the idea of breaking bread and drinking a cup as the elements of the Lord's Supper were not solidified until well into the third, if not the fourth century. So in the first century, then, what is to break bread and and drink a cup? And I have argued in my work that to break bread simply means to eat a meal. And it is McGowan and others have shown that the communion was not taken as as two elements, but was uh, a meal. And the cup is the ceremonial aspect of it. And so when we talk about eat this bread and drink this cup, it's a ceremonial meal. And I have argued that it is the Passover. So when when Yeshua says, do this in remembrance of me, and he has broken bread, and he has, you know, take this cup, he's talking about the ceremonial aspects of the Passover and the meal that that is eaten within the Passover. It's, it's it's not the elements of the of of communion because the yeah, elements yeah. of communion didn't come around until hundreds of years later. So there is a there is a chronological misorder here. And then uh, the the uh, next verse that uh, unashamed of Jesus brings up. And I'm not saying that this is unashamed of Jesus' view. I don't know, um, but this is the the standard response that I that I often get. Unashamed of Jesus then quotes Acts two forty six which says, so continuing daily in one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Oftentimes, uh, this is referred to as, or this is seen as a communion. It's not a communion. This is them eating together. Once again, it was a form of worship to eat a meal together. And so what they're saying is that they are communing together, they're worshiping together, they're being seen as one ecclesia. This has nothing to do with a with uh, with communion or with the Eucharist. And one of the ways that we know that is in Acts 27. In Acts 27, uh, they uh, Paul and a bunch of heathens and a bunch they're of on the prisoners, boat. they're on the, they're boat, on the right? boat, and they all and they all break bread together. So are you? And this has been when I was in, doing my my uh, Acts work. This was one of the biggest problems that the that the proponents of a of a early Eucharist had. And what they say is, well, okay, sometimes it can mean break it like having a meal, but other times it mean, but most of the time it means having communion. So in Acts 27, it just means that they that they had a meal. Or there was one commentator, I believe, that said, well, Paul converted all of them. Right. You know. So uh, I think that you're right. There could be an element of uh, there's something going on in the diaspora. Uh, there's something going on with the Corinth church. There could be the aspect of maybe maybe he's saying every year, when you do this. Right. right. That's right. But to see this as a institution of the Eucharist or an institution of communion, I, I think is horribly anachron- anachronistic. People are reading later tradition back into the first century. You know, we've hit hard on on Judaism in the past couple of shows, and the idea of reading the the Mishnah and the Talmud back into into the first century. But guess what? The church does it too, and this is probably the the biggest culprit right here is attempting to to read the the Eucharistic uh, tradition of later centuries back into the first century. It just is. It's not there. It's not there traditionally, and it's not there in the text. It's only there 
if you see it in the in the light of later texts and later tradition. That's the only time. Will there be another future Passover? Uh, Scott asks. I mean, th- this is one of the things that a lot of people are surprised about me. I, I've had numerous calls, even recently. I mean, in, even in the past three or four weeks, I've had people call and talk about the second exodus and that they believe the second exodus is going to happen in the, in, the, uh, you know, in the end times. Whether or not that might be the case, in other words, there is an exodus of people to Israel or to Jerusalem or whatever um, from the nations. I don't know. But I believe that the second exodus happened on the cross. And this is what we are supposed to be celebrating each year at Passover. And so do I believe in communion? Do I believe in what is commonly termed as the Eucharist? Yes, I believe it is the ceremonial aspects and the meal aspect of the Passover. So back to Brittany's question then. So we've answered all of that up to what gives the church the authority. I don't think that the church has the authority to to make it every week or, or every month or anything like that. However... Once again, when I think of communion, unless the church is going to say things like uh, it's a means of grace, which I, I, I have a problem with that because I'm not sure what each congregation means. But if they're not going to say that, if they're just going to say, well, we're doing what, what uh, you know, we're doing this in remembrance of Christ because this is what he told us to do. I have no problem eating a meal or eating a little cracker and some juice as a representation of me worshiping with a community. But once again, since... That we have, uh, since we have this language of grace being uh, attached to it, that's where I start to have problems. Well, and it, it crosses over also into a closed communion situation where you have so many people show up for the service, but only certain people have access to this means of grace. So, right. The question is there, okay, so what's the statement being made? What's the theological statement being made by that particular denomination? Um, someone might come and say, hey, I, I believe in the gospel, but I'm not a, I haven't signed my name on the dotted line with respect to this specific denomination. Therefore, I'm not allowed to participate in this means of grace. Is it a statement? And I think we've touched on this before with the Catholic Church, right? You Are you... There's no salvation outside of, of being part of the what do they call it? You know of of the church the, of the of the, of the, of the, of the yeah. mass of the yeah. of the of the mass. So we've kicked yeah. something off in the chat room, which is good. Uh, Joseph says, "Didn't the Qumran community refer to the bread of heaven in their meals? This may be a reference to an ex- expectation and hope in the connection to the Messiah and manna." The only uh, the only references that I used in my work on that one. Uh, concerning uh, Qumran was the fact that they do break bread and uh, have a ceremonial cup of wine before they eat. That's what they did. But but and, but also you, it's like if you're an outsider and you come into you join the Essene community, it's not. I think it's at least two years yeah. before you participate in the solid in the solid food. And and isn't you, it interesting? You have to pass. You you get exams. You have to demonstrate humility and submission to the authority of the, of the, you know, of the leadership. And yeah, you no, have she, to give, it, you, and it, you give all your all your worldly possessions have to go into a kind of an escrow account. <laughs> and this might that we might see a connection here in, in what unashamed of Jesus just just uh, posted, which is First Corinthians eleven twenty seven. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Yeah. So once again, I'm not sure why Unashamed of Jesus is posting these these verses. You would need to give more uh, more context to to why you're posting these specific verses. I mean, we could okay, talk I, about them for a, sure. Okay, a total footnote question. If we just limit ourselves to the development of like the Roman Church, okay, mm-hmm. would 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 there be a correlation between the the use of iconography and even statues and then the legitimate legitimation of why we can use icons why we can use statues even though the bible even though the old testament says don't in the, is there a correlation to that trajectory that goes oh yeah we also have new 
institutionalized rituals that are also different. What are those, do those develop along the same, like, is it this, like back to Brittany, is it the same irrigation of authority and, oh yeah. And the Sabbath now is Sunday because so we I, say I, so. Yeah, are, these the, par- are these all parallel lines in the, in history? I think the iconoclast uh, debates in the seventh century are, are, are a bit different because you have East and West uh, disagreeing with each other, right? The, the Eastern church says you can have icons as long as they're 2D and not 3D. Of course, they didn't use those languages. And the reason why is because a 3D icon would be a an idol. Whereas, a graven, yeah, I mean, it's right. a Whereas the Western yeah, church yeah. says, no, 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 that's not the case. But ultimately, it comes down to both churches, East and West, agree that the that uh, an icon is not to be worshipped, so, so they say. An icon they can is be not revered. Be, they can be what right. is it revered? It's 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 a it's a. <laughs> I mean, I, I I just studied this, and I'd have to go back and look again. But uh, but ultimately, it's uh, you're allowed to you're allowed to see the icon and and um, use it as worship, but not allowed to worship it itself. So There's I want to go to there sh- is like a, a strange. It's parallel to the rabbinic world of the Mishnah. A strange halacha. It would be like this. Let's say, let's say, you know, we went to someone's house for Christmas and they had a Christmas tree. And like someone went and just started bowing down to the Christmas tree and oh, right. yeah. worshiping the Christmas tree. You'd say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You've trans. Yeah. It's Hold okay to have there. the Christmas tree. Yeah. <laughs> stop. Yeah. You. Let me stop you right there. <laughs> so you have to have additional rules now. That right. emerged. It's like, okay, you can have the Christmas tree in your house, but you don't bow down to it. So, so there is good re- there is good theological reason for this, I believe. Now we're in a different realm, but uh, now we're in the <laughs> iconoclast uh, debate. But ultimately, I think that there is some good biblical evidence on why... No, now, d- please don't hear me say that I agree with icons, because I don't. In fact, I, I, am, I would be one of the iconoclast. But the, the point simply is this, that I understand where the theological mindset com- comes from, because you have things in scripture, like on the top of the ark, you have images of angelic beings, 3D angelic beings. In Solomon's temple, you have you know, angels. It, uh, the, the golden serpent that's put on a rod, right? So yeah. there, there, are, there are things that are used. There's oxen under Solomon's, the, the, the laver that holds the water in the courtyard. You have 12 oxen. So I hang on just a sec. I want to go to Sean. A lot of comments have happened. I want to go back to Sean's question. He says, "Big question. Consider what the church considering rather what the church believes about communion, especially the Presbyterian Church." I don't think that it's right to say especially because the idea of it is a means of grace is in the Presbyterian, the Lutheran, oftentimes in the Methodist. Uh, it's in the Episcopal, it's in the, it's in the Church of England, and it's in the Catholic Church. So you can't just say especially the Presbyterians. It's especially most of Christianity. Does this not mean we should not attend these kinds of churches? And I want to go back to Brittany's final point here, because she says in her question, she says... Thank you, Brittany, for your patience. Yeah, we've, thank we've, you. We've, thank we've, you for your question. Your question is framed the whole discussion here. So then give the church, okay, does this void it? And how do we handle the issue in non-Messianic gatherings? I would say probably churches. This is a great question. And thank you, Sean. Uh, was it Sean? Yes. Thank you, Sean, for the question as well. Um, I, I don't think that it, I don't think that we can say across the board one way or the other. I think that we have to go by from community to community. And the reason why is because I certainly would, I wouldn't go to a mass. I would never go to a, like just a a Catholic mass. I I, I agree with the I agree with the uh, with the reformers that the mass is a uh, idolatrous practice. So I wouldn't go to mass, but let's say that I go to an Episcopal church. Now I have done this before, and I have taken communion with them. However, I would not do that now. I, I wouldn't do that now. And the reason why is because my knowledge of what the Eucharist is and and the and the notion of um, of transubstantiation, I would I would not take communion with any group that believed in transubstantiation. That's number one. Number two, would I take communion with a group that believed that it was a means of grace? Now, I took communion recently in the, for a year straight with a wonderful community that I that is still very dear to my heart, and I love the people there. 
but the uh, and I they believe that you know in their writings they said on their website that uh, the communion was a means of grace. I did not know what that meant, and uh, in the beginning I was uncomfortable with that. But as we continued to go to the community, uh, it wasn't until the very end of our stay there that I heard it said from the pulpit. And when that when when I heard that, I, that's when I became very very uncomfortable, and I and. It, once again, this is a progression of my own theology. So, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to be honest here. Uh, I don't have this all figured out, but I have also determined for myself and for my family that I will not take communion with people who believe that it, it is a means of grace until I am able to understand what that means to the community. Because I don't, I, I don't think that that is, I don't think that that's right. And I think that that is a huge error in theology. And I'm not going to participate in something that I believe is a huge error like that. Now, if I go to, let's say, a Baptist group, because I think that the Baptists are probably uh, the farthest away, may, and maybe that's not even true, but a lot of the time they're the farthest away from, from the Catholic view of the, of the Eucharist. If I go to a Baptist congregation, they say, hey, this is not a means of grace. All we're doing is we're celebrating what Christ did on the on, at the Last Supper. We're in, you know, we believe that uh, Christ commanded us to do this as brothers and sisters in the Lord, we eat this together and we remember what Christ said. In that case, I would probably say, okay, I'm with you. I don't have a problem, even though I disagree with you that this is what Christ commanded us to do, I don't have a problem necessarily uh, you know, do, doing that. But this comes down to theology. So once again, uh, you know, to Sean's question and even to Brittany's question, I, per, this is all personal. You're going to have to figure this out on your own and how you would handle all this. But for me personally, I do think it matters what the actual congregation believes. We got a lot, a lot, a lot of comments going on in the chat room. Have you guys thought of having R.L. Solberg on? No, we do not do uh, interviews on this show. I would be happy to talk to Solberg um, in a uh, covenant conversation on pronomian.com, but I would not do, uh, but that, that's not what this show is for. If people want to respond to us, that's great. They can make uh, videos. They can write articles. They can write books. We don't do. Um, we don't do it for good reason. By the way, we don't we did do. It. We, we yeah, tried we did. It and we tried. Times. Not going to do it. Um, the we only had a couple good ones. You know. Yeah. We had. We had. There are exceptions Petrie, to the, right. Chris yeah. Tilling. We had some good. good there, ones. there are exceptions to the rules. I mean, to the rule. I won't say never. But I'm not just going to start bringing people onto this show. That's not, we're not going to do that again. Um, have you guys, okay, uh, I'm a pronomian Baptist, okay? My friend is pronomian Hebrew roots and other friends who are pronomian Pentecostal. It definitely crosses denominations. I agree with that completely. Um, okay, I just want to see if there's anything else. Only Catholics believe in transubstantiation. That is absolutely not true. There are many others who believe in God's real presence during communion. It is important to keep that discussion, a distinction. I, I, I disagree with that. I, I totally disagree with that. The Episcopals believe in tra transubstantiation. You know, when we talk about, back to the idea of sacrament, you know, one of the traditional Hebrew opening prayers before doing a commandment is, you know, blessed are you, Lord God, asher kidshanu b'mitzvotav, who has sanctified us by his commandments. Yeshua uses, in I think it's in the Gospel of John, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth, right? So the idea of believers being sanctified by the word of God is biblical. That's that's true, and that's, that's the scripture. Your word is truth, and it's through the truth that we're, we're sanctified. And it is by grace we are saved. It's not... It, if we isolate some ritual and we say, this is the means of grace, I, I'm real hesitant. Uh, you know, all sorts of alarms go off because either we're already abiding in grace. <clears throat> I mean, in Romans 5, right? It says, we, it says, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God, you know, and we have access into this grace in which we stand. That we we are abiding in grace, our life in in Messiah, you know, our being attached to the risen Messiah because we died with Him on the cross. This is all a function of grace. So if once I start creating this thing of means of grace, and I start drawing people's attention to specific works, 
right? And these are works, I would say these are similar to works of the law. That, that, that it's an idea that you're going to do these things, these rituals, and these rituals are somehow a means of this grace. Now I've distracted from the clear message of the scripture, which should be our orientation for what is grace. What is grace? We learned that by the scriptures, not by doing rituals. Now, God does give commandments. And so we could say, does, is the Sabbath a means of grace? You know, I, I'm, if, we're, if we have to use terms of means of grace because of our one Torah perspective, we would just have to go back to the commandments. And, and, and of course, Pesach, Passover would fall under that. And then there would be an accommodation for the diaspora Gentiles who are coming and learning. Uh, they're new to the whole thing, teaching uh, meals, meals where there is a teaching about the Passover, about the Torah, about who Yeshua is. What does it mean that he became a curse for us, right, to redeem us? What does redemption by his blood mean? What is forgiveness of sins? All these things require an understanding of the Torah for it to make any sense. So a pronomian or a pro-Torah educational outreach that has teaching meals. What what what, what do we call those? Uh, uh, the dupnons? Dupnon, um, yeah. The de- dupnon and different kind of places where we know that they used meals as teaching uh, opportunities to teach. That, that's and had, acceptable. Sir, and, that's an accommodation had, that's acceptable. But does it replace the Pascha? No, it doesn't. And had ceremonial aspects to the Dapnons. They had ceremonial aspects of Dapnons even when they weren't on holidays. I want, so uh, just to, I think that this is a comment that I'll address uh, in, not just in the, in the chat. Uh, Sean says, I still appreciate appreciate and think you guys are brothers and sisters, but I think the term, that is pronomian, needs to stand alone, and we're not going to agree on that. That's right, we're not going to agree on that. I think that uh, as soon as you start to say, uh, make it more than a theological standpoint, then it falls apart. And this is, I mean... Here's, Hebrew, why, here's what's going to happen. Here's where the, I see the, the future the of that. Hebrew, the Hebrew roots movement is what's going to happen. Well, here, Nobody here, agrees. Here's a limit. Yeah. Well, here's a limit. Let's say a Baptist comes to my door or something, and we start talking about the law. And they're like, yeah, I'm pronomian. I would be forced to say, no, you're not. Now, all of a sudden, I'm going to have to paint you, the Baptist, as antinomian and myself as pronomian. And then I'm going to have to explain to them why they think they might think they're pronomian, but they're not really. In my viewpoint, that's not going to be a fruitful conversation because now I'm, I'm, it's, I've, I've drawn a line and I'm saying you're on the other side and we're not connected. My, my, my strategy, in my experience, we will, it's good to find commonality and build from commonality and that that's more fruitful for building relationship, but just to draw the line, Oh, you're Baptist and you, you're not pronomian, you're antinomian. And not let me tell you why. That is going to foster hostility. Again, that's my limited experience. So the, the, re, the, 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 the moment, the moment I knew that, uh, that my view was that pronomian should be a theology and not anything more than that, was when I was talking to two other brothers in the Lord who said, who said I'm pronomian. And they were talking about making this into something that was a movement or making like a it into a de- like a denomination or something like that. And I realized that I could be a brother, a brother with them in the- theology and in the Lord, but that when it came to uh, when it came to the <laughs> maybe being in a actual community with them, there was going to be large theological issues that were going to get in, in, in the debate and that I would not be able to, to sign any kind of a, you know, a faith statement in certain areas that, that was, so I'm with these two brothers, love them to death. I hold them as brothers, brothers in the Lord, consider them part of God's family, 
would sit down and have a meal with them, would worship with them. But when it came to the in intricacies of having a community with them, now we're going to have some issues because there are not minor theological issues, but major theological issues that were going to be a problem. And so if they're pronomian and people are looking at pronomian saying, these people are pronomian, I'm going to have to say, whoa, 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 wait. I believe I'm pronomian, but I disagree with X, Y, Z. So now all of a sudden we're doing the exact same thing that happens in the Hebrew Roots movement. Whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa, whoa. I believe this, but let me give you a every laundry label, list. Every, la every word, every term has drift, has a semantic range that you take it and it, it's going to be slightly different meaning in different contexts. And that's, that's the nature, right? It's not words that have meaning. It's meaning has words. And so pronomian is not a special word that somehow is now immune to that kind of variability or that kind of polysemy or change. It, it, it's helpful in as much as it helps accomplish a goal. And, it, and if it helps accomplish a goal to rally people to say, yeah, you know, I have a positive, I, I, I have a positive view of the Torah. That's a connective point. Uh, now, like we've talked about, like the Presbyterians, you know, that maybe they have or Baptists, you know, certain positive orientations to the Torah, but then they're going to have very specific pet places where they say, oh, that's ceremonial law and things like that. Then I would say you can, no, you don't need to avoid talking about those things. You can talk about those things. But, um, and if you think that, wow, you know, I think this person thinks there's pro their pronomian, but they keep Easter. Well, if, you know, instead of calling them antinomian, you could say, okay, let's talk about what it means to be pronomian with them and bring those issues. Say, okay, if you're, how do you understand the Sabbath? How do you understand the food exactly. loss? How do you understand circumcision? Yeah. And can you reconcile for me, if you, if you do have a pronomian view in your eyes, how do you understand that? And that might be an avenue for them to, you know, reflect on uh, some of the dogma that they've, uh, learned along the way. Agreed. Um, yeah, I, I, okay. I'll leave it there because I think that, uh, there's, I think people have an idea in their head of who I'm talking about, what I'm talking about. But, uh, I think that there's larger issues that people are unaware of, which is fine. That's, it doesn't matter. The point simply is, is that, um, uh, as soon as you make something into a denomination, or a movement, what you do is you exclude other people. And I think that the idea of Torah observance is something that the, the scriptures are clear about, that the Gentiles and, the, and those, I believe, in the church who have a faith in Christ will come to a pronomian perspective. And as soon as you start putting boundaries around that, you exclude people. You put a, you put a wall up, and people aren't going to come over that wall. So I would well, rather if you, if, include right, if, you, people. if you call them antinomian, if someone says, oh, I believe the Bible, I believe in Jesus, oh, you're antinomian, I, don't, I wouldn't lead with that. Right. I'm not saying it won't, it, that you should never use the term antinomian to talk, you know, it, it could very well be, but, you know, I, I wouldn't lead with that. Right. Well, look at that. It's been an hour. We've talked about Brittany's question and Brittany's question alone, which is great. I actually appreciate that. And uh, I, think that, uh, I think that we can hold off all the rest of everything that we were going to talk, everything else that we were going to talk about. If you look in our description, we had three other things we were going to talk about. Not today. We're going to talk about them next week, which is great. Um, we have an audio clip that we were going to talk about. We have um, some great questions about well, what I would consider anachronistic views of the timelines of uh, rabbinic Ju uh, Judaism versus Christianity, so on and so forth. Um, not a problem. We will talk about this all next week. I appreciate everyone in the chat room, by the way. And, you know, I, I do, I, I should say this, if you're still with us, if you're still listening to us at this point in the, in the show, that means that you've pro you're probably in the chat room. So I will say this, <clears throat> 
it's easy for me to look in the chat room and respond to people and respond to things that are being said. And I understand fully that the people in the chat room don't have the voice that I have because I have a microphone. All you have is, is a, a chat. And so that's, it's difficult because I'm sure that it feels like I'm really hitting against certain people or certain, or certain arguments. But I, I do think it's important to read off some of these comments because they're great comments, even the ones that we disagree with. If I disagree with you, that's totally fine. We can disagree. I have no problem with that. So uh, don't think that I'm that I'm just trying to pick on people. That's not what I'm trying to do. I think that some of these comments and some of the things that are said are uh, in opposition to what we're saying are actually really important. I think they're important because, once again, going to a theology, I think that it's important to show that we can disagree on various issues, maybe even issues like sacraments, maybe even issues like communion versus Passover, maybe issues you know, pronomian versus, you know, uh, pronomian sect or whatever you want to say. We can disagree on those things. It makes no difference in the body of Christ, right? We're all still brothers and, and sisters in the Lord. And so I, I don't want you to feel like I'm, I'm picking you on you. That's not what I'm trying to do. I do try to, by the way, uh, leave the, the chat up in the sidebar uh, so that people later can read the chat as well. And, and if you're listening to this later and you're not on YouTube, if you want to see the chat and you want to see what people have said in the side, then uh, you can go watch the YouTube video on uh, on a computer and the chat will show up on the right hand side. Okay. Uh, it's been fun. It's been real. It's been real fun. I think we should be back next week, right? I don't see a reason why we wouldn't be. We will be back next week. By the way, next week we will have summer producer credits up. People will be able to go and get their summer producer credits. If you're on a reoccurring producer credit, I understand that you've already paid, and we will get you your producer credit uh, merch in the mail shortly. All right, guys. Uh, let me find some outro music here, and uh, we'll go with it. All right. Well, we uh, thank you very much. We hope that this conversation has done at least one thing. That is to glorify our great God and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. Why? You know why. Because Messiah matters. <laughs>